In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the past several weeks in our lectionary, our Gospel texts have been from the Gospel of John. We have been hearing about bread. Lots of bread. We have witnessed Jesus feed a crowd with five loaves of bread and two fish. We have been reminded of how the Israelites fed on manna in the wilderness. And we have heard Jesus' teaching that he is the bread of life. Today, when we return, to the, we return to the Gospel of Mark in our lectionary cycle. Here in the Gospel of Mark, we are in the middle of a different food scene. Jesus and his disciples are gathered together and are eating. And Jesus is asked a question. Why didn't some of your disciples wash their hands before eating? Before we talk about Jesus' response, Let's pause here to talk about hand washing. When we go into a public restroom, we see reminders to employees that they must wash their hands before returning to work. We also see hand washing guides that refer to COVID and remind us to wash for at least 20 seconds. Sometimes these signs have cute graphics, which can make the 20 seconds seem to pass by a bit more quickly. We wash our hands after working in the dirt or when we're preparing food. And since I work in healthcare, I am used to regular practices around hand washing and hand sanitizing. We are all used to washing our hands to prevent the spread of germs or when our hands are visibly dirty. None of these times are what the Pharisees and scribes are talking about when they ask about hand washing. They are not telling Jesus and the disciples that their hands are germy or physically dirty. Instead, the word that they use to describe the disciples' hands is a very precise word. They notice that some of the disciples are eating with defiled hands. So let's talk about this word, defiled. Defilement is, importantly, not about physical uncleanliness. Defilement is also not about sin. There is nothing morally wrong with being in a defiled state. Instead, defilement, in Jesus' time, pertained to a ritual impurity that was a normal part of life. Hand washing, in this context, is not about physical or moral cleansing. Instead, it is part of a ritual part of a tradition. It happened even if someone's hands were already physically clean. Now the ritual of hand washing before eating in Jesus' time likely came from practices related to ritual impurity at the ancient temple in Jerusalem. The priests at the temple washed their hands as part of a ritual before eating the food that had been offered. This became extended as a tradition among some Jews. Traditions such as hand washing were not commanded by scripture, but instead traditions are practices that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. Scripture does not actually include a requirement for hand washing prior to eating but rather ritual hand washing had become a practice and a custom. And this understanding of tradition is central to understanding Jesus' response in our gospel text today. So let's go back to the question. Jesus has asked why his disciples did not follow the traditions of the elders. Why, he has asked, did some of the disciples eat with defiled hands and not ritually wash their hands before eating? In his response, Jesus does not criticize the act of hand washing. He does not criticize the traditions that have been passed to his generation. 
there is nothing inherently wrong with the ritual of hand washing. There is nothing inherently wrong with this tradition. Instead, Jesus points to something different. Jesus condemns hypocrisy. He condemns the hypocrisy of focusing on a symbolic ritual related to faith while ignoring something more important, ignoring what it actually means to live as a follower of God. In short, Jesus says some pointed words to the Pharisees, to the scribes, and to all of us. A call to us to consider how to orient our lives as God's people. Jesus draws from scripture to point out the hypocrisy in focusing only on outward appearances and glossing over the morality that we actually practice. He quotes from Isaiah's prophecy about Judah. And he quotes from scripture, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Honoring God with our words and with traditions is well and good, Jesus seems to be saying, but what really matters is what is in the heart. As we gather on this holiday weekend, on the last of our summer Sundays, we are invited to look within and to look ahead. Instead of a light text that reminds us of barbecues, picnics, and parades, none of which I really found anywhere in our text today, Instead of all that, we are confronted by Jesus with a long list of sins. Not what we might necessarily think of for a holiday weekend, and yet here we are. So Jesus, with this list, invites his listeners to look within themselves at their hearts and at their own morality. His invitation here is not about pointing to the morality of others. It is not about the sins that we hear about on the news or that we hear about in gossip from those around us. Rather, he calls us to examine the evil intentions in our own hearts. We are invited to look within ourselves at those places where, like the Pharisees and like the scribes, there is a gap between what we say and what we do we are invited to ever more deeply live out in our lives the faith that we profess, that we may draw closer to God. Our first reading today from Deuteronomy similarly invites us into closer relationship with God. Moses is speaking to the Israelites during the time of their exile, and he points to what is important, namely, keeping the commandments of God. Keeping God's commandments has to do with alignment between word and action. It is not about outward appearances or added customs or traditions, but it is about what comes from the heart. James fleshes this out for us in our epistle today. We are drawn back to our source, God, the Father of lights. And we are called to notice and to strengthen the light inside of each of us. In words reminiscent of Jesus' quotation of Isaiah, James exhorts us to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. And James gives, gives us a roadmap for how to be doers of the, of the word. Through the ways our faith shows through in our care for others, and he gives the examples of caring for orphans and widows in their distress, and in the ways we draw close to God in our lives. It is fitting that our gospel today occurs in Mark shortly after the account of the feeding of the 5,000, and in the midst of descriptions of Jesus healing those around him and casting out demons. Jesus is at work and active in the world around him. May we follow him, and in the words of James, be not doers who forget. I'm sorry, in the words of James, let me try that again. 
Be not hearers who forget, but doers who act. Doers who will be blessed in our doing. Amen.